The EPA defines phytoremediation as the direct use of green plants and their associated microorganisms to stabilize or reduce contamination in soils, sludges, sediments, surface water, or groundwater. It's safe to begin the explanation of phytoremediation with us, humans. We are the ones that are producing the majority of the toxins that need to be remediated from the soil. If left alone, the land that we require becomes useless. Then, there is a plant that begins to establish. Let's just say it's a hybrid poplar tree. Poplars are the plant of species of choice for phytoremediation due to the recent findings suggesting that they can take up and degrade organic contaminants and certain heavy metals. The fast growth of poplar trees makes them ideal phytoremediation trees due to their fast establishment, deep roots, rich associated fauna, and most importantly, their adaptability. At the groundwater level and the soil level, two phytoremediation processes occur. Phytostabilization refers to the immobilization of contaminants in soil through absorption and accumulation by roots, absorption onto roots, or precipitation within the root zone. The plant and its roots also prevent contaminant migration via wind and water erosion, leaching, and soil dispersion. Rhizofiltration refers to the approach of using hydroponically cultivated plant roots to remediate contaminated water through absorption, concentration, and precipitation of pollutants. It also filters through water and dirt. Phytoaccumulation is the process where plant roots uptake metal contaminants from the soil and translocate them to their above soil tissues. Once the plants have grown and absorbed the metal pollutants, they are harvested and disposed of safely. This process is repeated several times to reduce contamination to acceptable levels. Phytovolatilization is the process where plants uptake contaminants, which are water soluble, and release them into the atmosphere as they transpire the water. The contaminant may become modified along the way as the water travels along the plant's vascular system, from the roots to the leaves. The contaminants then evaporate or volatize into the air surrounding the plant. And there you have the four main components of phytoremediation. The Oregon Poplar Site, located in Clackamas, Oregon, comprises three to four acres within a vacant parcel located parallel to the Mountain Scott Creek stream. The site had an abandoned grassy field in a primarily commercial and light industrial area. Contaminants of concern at the site were primarily volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, resulting most likely from illegal dumping activities. The groundwater beneath the site is shallow, 2 to 10 feet below the ground surface, locally confined, and in hydraulic contact with the Mountain Scott Creek stream. These characteristics, along with low concentration of contaminants and little to no risk to human health, make, a good, make the site a good candidate for phytoremediation. Hybrid poplar trees were planted on site in 1998 to remediate the groundwater contaminated with VOCs. By July 30, 2002, the trees had not only survived, but shown considerable growth. Four of the larger trees were selected as the focus of sampling because their roots were most likely to be in contact with the contaminated groundwater. Although the water and soil samples proved inconclusive, tissue samples taken from the four trees indicated that the trees were actively removing VOCs from the groundwater and soil. Although tissue samples from all selections of the trees revealed Contaminant uptake, higher contaminant concentrations, seem to be found in the trunk rather than the leaf tissue. The success of the trees at the Oregon Poplar site supports the notion that phytoremediation may be an innovative technology worthy of nationwide consideration. Besides poplar trees, there are many other plants that can be used for phytoremediation projects. Some examples include alfalfa, carrots, fescue,
goat willow. Indian mustard. Red twig dogwood. And sunflowers. Unfortunately, there are some disadvantages to phytoremediation. Some include 1. Usually limited to sites with lower concentrations of pollution. 2. The effectiveness is dependent upon the depth of the plant's root. 3. It is dependent on the plant's tolerance to the contaminant. 4. Contaminants may be released back into the environment through natural plant life and death cycles, or by burning the contaminant-filled plant. 5. The cleanup of a site takes longer than most other methods. Besides a couple disadvantages, there are great advantages to phytoremediation. Some include 1. It is cheaper than most other treatments, for example, excavation. 2. It is less destructive to the environment than other treatments. 3. The risk of further contamination is reduced. 4. Plants may treat more than one pollutant at once. And 5. And most importantly, it's aesthetically pleasing. Yay! Use of native plants in phytoremediation provides advantages over other species and helps bring back the heritage of flora lost through human activity. In addition to restoring biodiversity to areas that have been disturbed, remediating sites using native species provides for wildlife habitat enhancement and conservation. Unlike many introduced species, once established, native plants do not require fertilizer, pesticides, or watering. Use of native plants in site restoration may serve to restore wetlands and other habitats and create nature parks, sanctuaries, and other green areas. So, simply put, Instead of relying on conventional methods that can be environmentally disruptive, financially costly, and energy intensive, phytoremediation simply capitalizes upon basic plant biological processes and the constant natural flow of elements from soil to roots as food. And luckily for us, many plants aren't particular about whether these elements are found naturally occurring in soil or added by humans. In 1986, Chernobyl witnessed the worst nuclear accident in history. When nuclear reactor 4 malfunctioned, it reduced a thriving city to a ghost town. All of the citizens had to be evacuated and they were never able to return. People assume that with all of the radiation pollution, nothing can survive there. In reality, the city is thriving. Plants and animals seem to have found a way to adapt to the radiation in the soil, and this may hold the key to improving soil fertility and cleaning up after disasters. Some plants have the natural ability to draw toxic heavy metals from the soil and store them in their leaves and stems. These plants are called hyperaccumulators. They have certain genes that are needed to deal with the metals and can do so without becoming poisoned. A great example of one of these plants is Telaspe. It is a member of the cabbage family and can absorb up to 30,000 parts per million of zinc and 1,500 parts per million cadmium without becoming poisoned. A typical plant can only absorb 1,000 parts per million of zinc and 20 to 50 parts per million cadmium. In Chernobyl, scientists started with sunflowers. As time went by, they also planted soybeans and flax on highly contaminated, restricted areas of the city. They grew just as well as control crops planted in decontaminated regions, and by studying the proteins involved in taking in metals, they were able to better understand how plants can deal with the pollution. Basically, the pollutants mimic nutrients the plant would take in naturally. The plants alter their proteins to deal with the new metals, and the waste is stored in the leaves, stems, and shoots. The plants seem to have a harder time absorbing the heaviest metals like uranium and cesium, but if the soil is treated with citrate, 
an organic substance which partially breaks down the uranium, the plants can absorb the uranium and tolerate larger amounts in the vascular systems. Equally as important, this new technology can help the agriculture industry. The population is booming, expected to hit 9.1 billion by 2050. Thanks to the research that has been done on phytoremediators, acidic or otherwise barren lands can be remedied and used for production. Not only do we have the possibility of preventing other cities from becoming like Chernobyl, but we can use that same technology in our everyday lives to provide food for the world. We may even be able to make the polluted lands habitable for humans again.